Good afternoon. On behalf of Swinburne and the National Centre for Reconciliation Practice, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2022 Swinburne Annual Reconciliation Lecture. My name is Professor Andrew Gunston. I'm the Executive Director of Reconciliation Strategy and Leadership and the National Centre for Reconciliation Practice at Swinburne. I respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the lands on which Swinburne's campuses are located, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. I also pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are online today and acknowledge the continuing and unceded sovereignties of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. It is a great pleasure to introduce Wurundjeri Elder, Auntie Georgina Nicholson. Auntie Georgina is passionate about promoting Wurundjeri warrior on culture and frequently represents Wurundjeri warrior on cultural heritage Aboriginal corporation the peak body representing traditional owners of Melbourne and surrounding territories, and events for the general public. Aunty Georgina is passionate about music and the arts. I'd like to invite Aunty Georgina to deliver the welcome to country. Well, thank you, Andrew. Hello, everyone. Uh, my apologies for not being on video today for I have some internet problems. So this is how we're doing it tonight. Um, hello, my name is Georgina Nicholson and I am a proud Wurundjeri Wurrung woman. Wurundjeri being part of the Kulin Nation. The Kulin Nation consists of five clans and they are Wurundjeri, Wathurong, Tunurong, Boonwurrung and Jarjawurrung, I believe. Wurundjeri being all of the Melbourne CBD and surrounding country, extending north to the Great Dividing Range, east to Mount Borbore, south to Mordialic Creek and west to the mouth of Werribee River. So I would like to acknowledge and pay my respect to our ancestors who walked and lived on this land as free spirits for a very, very long time. Also our elders, past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be online with us tonight, and I pay my respects to you all and to your elders. I would also like to say thank you to Swinburne for incorporating an important ancient custom into your events, a so welcome to country. I would like to acknowledge Vice-Chancellor Pascal Cuesta and Sue Ann Hunter, my cousin. Hi, Sue Ann. <laughs> For those of you tuning in from Wurundjeri country, I would like to say to you, Wumanjika, Wurundjeri, Balak, Yemen, Kundibik. And I'd just like to tell you what I've said in our Wurundjeri language, and that is welcome to the land of the Wurundjeri people. So for those of you tuning in from locations across Victoria and perhaps beyond, um, I would like to acknowledge all of the traditional owners on the lands that you are coming in from tonight and um, I'd like to pay my respects to them all and to their elders. So as we navigate our way through this COVID-19 pandemic, I reflect on the legacy of those who have come before me. Um, I reflect on the long, unbroken, strong line of Aboriginal women I come from, and I think about the challenges they faced, and I do draw strength from them. Uh, one of those women being my mother, Martha Margaret Nicholson, Nee Terrick, she was delivered by her grandmother, Granny Jemima, and that was on Corrandirk Aboriginal Mission near the present-day town of Hillsville. So Granny Jemima was already teaching our mother the importance of family and culture and caring for one another and connection to land. Years later, our mother met a deadly Irish man called Patrick, and that was on a blind date in Melbourne in the early 1930s. In 1937, Mummy and Daddy were married in a registry office and they had 16 children, eight boys, eight girls, all single babies, no twins, no cheating, LOL. <laughs> I'm the youngest of the 16 and my sister Pat Ockwell is the eldest. Sister Pat is an amazing senior elder who has made a lifelong commitment to her peoples, to her communities. Um, for Sister Pat turned like, she's 85 I think now, um, and for an Aboriginal woman to reach that age is a milestone. For they say the life, that life expectancy gap is somewhere between 12 and 15 years between non-Indige people and, and Indige people. So um, that's quite sad, really. And we do have a lot of sorry business in our Aboriginal families and communities. 
Um, but we must carry on our culture for our people as our ancestors did for us and my mother and her mother and so on have done for me. So I stand here today because of my mother, Martha Nicholson. Um, she was a very strong cultural woman who instilled great values in me. So William Barrack, his younger sister Annie Barrett, that is my direct ancestral bloodline right there. So one of our traditions being our Wurrung language, it is part of our rich, deep heritage. And I like to say, like Mandy Nicholson says, my niece, our language has been sleeping, but we are waking it up now. So some of the ways we keep our culture alive is through songs, stories and performances, etc. So the coronavirus pandemic has changed the world in ways we would never have imagined. And the implications for our community have been profound for our health, our well-being and our jobs. But in many ways, this event online tonight has brought into focus the importance of relationships with family and connecting with one another as a community. I think as people, we do crave and we need connection. Um, I didn't realise how important this was until it was taken from me. It has been quite a men mentally uh, challenging time. I live alone, quite lonely. Um, so, yeah, um, and it's still here and it's not going away in, um, anytime soon, I don't think, the COVID. Um, so Aboriginal culture is the longest, oldest continuing culture. It goes back to 80,000 years plus. So we as Aboriginal people, we do know about resilience and solidarity and connection to land is important. So... Um, there have been no treaties with us up to date, um, but hopefully that will change in the near future with the First Peoples Assemblies happening. Um, and we have never ceded our sovereignty. So, you know, our ancestors never gifted our land away or sold it. Um, so always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so Wurundjeri people would just like you to respect the land, the waters, the flora and fauna. And of course we respect each other. And thank you, Swinburne for um, uh, inviting me along tonight to do the welcome. Take care and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ani Georgina, for your very generous welcome to country. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Pascal Cuesta, Vice-Chancellor and President of Swinburne. Professor Cuesta guides Swinburne's vision to be a world-class university, creating social and economic impact through science, technology, innovation and is also our RAP champion. I would like to invite Professor Quester to address us. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you so much, Auntie Georgina, for this warm and personal welcome. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that I, too, am standing on Wurundjeri land. The Wurundjeri are the traditional custodian of the land on which the campuses of Swinburne are, uh, stand, and we are reminded every day of the fact that this is a land on which we are privileged to be able to walk, a land that was never um, ceded and never gifted and will always be Wurundjeri land. I do pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. It's my privilege to welcome you all for our 2022 Swinburne Animal Reconciliation Lecture. And I'm especially delighted to welcome Commissioner Sue Ann Hunter for this um, particular proceeding. The Europe Justice Commission is an incredible historic move towards truth telling. It will lead to the further education of Victorians and the wider public of indigenous knowledges and experiences and the reforms needed for reconciliation. I'm sure my enthusiasm to hear more about this important work of the commission will be shared by everyone online today. I'm so sorry that we're not meeting in person, but this is what technology has done. It has enabled us to connect online. I sincerely thank Sue Ann for joining us tonight for this very important annual event for the Swinburne community. The Swinburne Annual Reconciliation Lecture is a key part to our 2020-2023 Reconciliation Action Plan, or RAP, and our national leadership role in reconciliation. Swinburne was the first university in the country to achieve an elevated status for the RAP in 2017. We remain one of only three universities at that level, a fact we're very proud of, although we would much rather there were many more of us at that level of, of commitment. Our latest RAP has four key priorities, embedding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander self-determination, entrenching Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges, 
ensuring Swinburne as a culturally safe place for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, students, alumni and partners. And finally, ensuring reconciliation is embedded across all parts of our institution. Recently, we launched the National Centre for Reconciliation Practice. It's a first of its kind, driving systemic change, greater understandings and broader engagement. The National Centre has already appointed 60 research affiliates from a diverse range of disciplines, including Indigenous studies, astronomy, education, entrepreneurship, health, history, sport and technology. And they will undertake this work across four key themes, cultural safety, indigenous knowledges, indigenous rights, and reconciliation movements. The National Center will take a multidisciplinary approach to exploring nationally significant reconciliation matters and will host a rich program of engagement, outreach, education, and research activities. The National Center's establishment is a significant piece of work, and I want to take a brief moment to celebrate the particular role that Professor Andrew Gunston has played in continuing to lead reconciliation and the RAP, and now also, of course, leading the National Center of Reconciliation Practice here at Swinburne. Thank you so much, Andrew. We really, really value your contribution to this. We've also recently welcomed an inaugural Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous Engagement, Professor John Evans, who I'm sure is on the line to Swinburne. This was a game changing appointment for Swinburne and one that I'm personally very excited about. John is dedicated to leading, guiding and governing the strategic direction of Swinburne in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander initiatives and strategy. And I look forward to continuing to work closely with him and as well as with Andrew and the broader MTC team. Events such as this one today that bring people together around a shared purpose remind us of the responsibility we all have for advancing reconciliation. While listening to Commissioner Hunter, I encourage everyone to consider how you can embed reconciliation into every aspect of your lives. Reconciliation is the responsibility of us all, and I am grateful to be working on meaningful action with you. Thank you very much, and I look forward to listen to your deadly talk, Suan. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, and thank you for your continuing support and leadership in this space. Since I created the two annual public lectures at Swinburne back in 2016, the Reconciliation Lecture and the Brack Wong Oration, we've been extraordinarily privileged to hear from the following outstanding Indigenous leaders. Adjunct Professor Muriel Bamblett, AM. Uncle Jack Charles. Crystal D. Napoli. Senator Pat Dodson. Belinda Duarte. Jill Gallagher, AO. Stan Grant. Dr. Jackie Huggins, AM. Professor John Maynard. Dr. Lois Peeler, AM. Professor Lester Irubina Rigney, AM. Uncle Wayne Thorpe. And tonight, Commissioner Sue Ann Hunter. And as I've reflected on the areas that have been discussed at these lectures over the years, it's very diverse areas from life stories to astronomy to treaties, self determination, history, and education. But the key area of truth telling has been present in all these lectures. So the critical importance of truth telling is widely recognised, including by the Uluru Statement from the Heart and its calls for voice, treaty, and truth by the Victorian government, which has created the Europe Justice Commission, the nation's first formal truth-telling body, by Reconciliation Australia and state and territory reconciliation bodies as essential for any genuine substantive reconciliation process, by many organisations around Australia, including Swinburne, which is strongly committed to truth-telling through our 2020-23 wrap, and by more than 50 countries over the past half a century that have established truth and reconciliation commissions. The National Centre for Reconciliation Practice is currently developing a comprehensive and exciting program of work, including education, research and outreach activities in relation to this key area of truth telling. Tonight, we are privileged to hear from Commissioner Sue Ann Hunter. Commissioner Hunter is a proud Burundi and Nungarai Ilan Warong woman and Deputy Chair and Commissioner with the Europe Justice Commission, the first formal truth telling body for First Peoples in Australia. The Bureau of Justice Commission was established as a Royal Commission to hear 
record and address the truths about First Peoples' experience of colonisation in Victoria since 1788. Please welcome Commissioner Sue Ann Hunter. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And I would like to start by acknowledging um, the ancestral lands that I'm on, the lands of the Wurundjeri people, my people. I honour Aunty Georgina and thank her for a generous welcome and I honour all my ancestors and elders and to those who fought for us for a voice so we can come to the table with our ways of being, knowing and doing and also to those who have found their way home, to those still searching, to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, zooming in. As Andrew mentioned, I'm a Wurundjeri Murray Ilamurung woman and in our language, we say uh, woman jekka, which most people refer to as welcome. But when broken down, it's true meaning and means to come with purpose, which is what I bring in every aspect of my life. And I also bring that here this evening. So I want to thank you uh, to Professor Andrew Gunston for his warm introduction and particularly your invitation. Um, after hearing those that have presented before, it's an honour to present to you today the Swinburne University Annual Reconciliation Lecture for 2022. So today I'm going to talk to you about how I understand reconciliation and the role of truth-telling in its promotion. I'm also going to talk to you about what I see in my role as a commissioner with the Yorook Justice Commission, as well as provide some background around Yorook's establishment, our mandate and um, our progress to date. And within my presentation, you're going to hear from two elders via video. It's, it's crucial we hear the, their voices, and I'm honoured to facilitate that as my role as a commissioner. But first to reconciliation, a concept that I have a complex relationship with. So when you reconcile with something or someone, it's about restoring or repairing. You might restore peace or settle a quarrel. But reconciliation in its purest form is a restoration of a relationship between equals. And that's what I have trouble with, is how we affect repair on a relationship that was founded in violence, where one party to the relationship from the first gunshot fired 15 minutes after arrival on Gadigal country never played fairly and certainly didn't consider themselves as equals. How do you reconcile a history built upon a pop falsehood? So I was raised, not that long ago, by the way, during a time when Australian history taught in schools began with the arrival of Captain Cook. The history of what come before European arrival was nothing more than a footnote. And the history of what happened after, a white triumph of will, of making good, the promise of an inhospitable and uncivilised terrain. Nowhere was there space to learn about the brutality of colonisation and its destruction of community, country, language, our law, L-O-R-E, and self. No was, nowhere was there a space to celebrate First Peoples' history or our culture, our enduring survival and our continued activism. First Peoples were erased and our stories were unheard. Reconciling with our history starts by ending this silence and that can only happen where there is space enough for the truth to be heard and people enough to hear it. The data from the 2020 Australian Reconciliation Barometer showed that over one third of Australians surveyed were unsure of or disbelieved fundamental aspects of our shared history. And that includes the presence of First Peoples in Australia at the time of European arrival, the occurrence of mass killings of First Peoples, our incarceration, our forced removal from our lands and restriction of movement. Now, that's a lot of hidden history right there and it's a lot of missed opportunities to learn from. But reassuringly, 89% of Australians surveyed believe the importance of the country undertaking a formal truth-telling process. So our country must continue to learn about and reconcile with its past before we can move forward together. And that requires action from each and every one of us, not just your First Nations friends from uni 
or your Reconciliation Action Plan Coordinator or the other extremely representative member of the Assembly or Parliament. That is a shared responsibility. This is shared. We all serve to gain from this. So we must share the responsibility. Our shared history is shameful, but it must be reckoned with so that a new relationship may be built with First Nations people, one that embeds respect and fairness. It isn't so much a restoration that's needed, it's a reset. And I feel the momentum is with us. Events like this one fill me with a sense of hope about the future, as does my work with your book. So for those of you who may not be aware, but Andrew did mention that your Rook Justice Commission is a royal commission established in the conventional way by Letters Patent in May 2021. But in all ways, your Rook is anything but conventional. Your Rook is the result of continued advocacy and activism, and we owe a vast debt of gratitude to the generations of First Peoples who fought tirelessly for this. And your Rook has been extremely hard fought for. It was established at the recommendation of the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria and in recognition of the centrality of truth-telling as a foundational step towards treaty. Yuruk means truth in the language of Wamba Wamba and truth and justice are the guiding principles for our commission. And at the commission, we have three key objectives. The first is to deliver truth through the creation of a lasting public record based on First Peoples' experience of systemic injustice since the start of colonisation, the consequences of these experiences, and who or what is responsible. Secondly, it's to promote an understanding by bringing all Victorians with us on the journey of deep listening, learning about our shared past, its impact on all of us, the strength and resilience of First Peoples' culture, knowledge and traditions that have survived against all odds. And lastly, to advance justice through transformation, through recommending changes to laws, institutions and systems, which can be taken up through treaty negotiations and which are designed to help build the foundations for a new relationship between First Peoples, the state and all Victorians. The scope and scale of the inquiry is, is huge. It's vast. It's groundbreakingly bold. And we're very pleased and we're very honoured and we will live up to uh, the task. It is the first Royal Commission of its kind and we seek to embrace that difference in all aspects of our work. If it's the first inquiry to examine the issues of systemic injustice, and its impacts on our community through amplifying the voices and lived experiences of First Nations people. And I would say it's more than amplifying the voices, it's bringing the voices to the forefront and making change and facilitating those voices. So we make sure that every step of the process is culturally respectful and culturally safe. And as a practitioner, I have uh, seen time and time again the therapeutic benefits of connection to culture and connection to community from our people. For me, trauma-informed practice goes hand in hand with culturally safe practice. And when you are asking a community of people to come with you on a journey towards truth and justice, building trust in the safety of the process is essential. And you often hear the saying, there is no treaty without truth. Truth is the first step. But I would say there is no truth without trust. And that's something that we have to rebuild. When we want to visit the elders on country, every effort is made to ensure our culturally respectful traditions are upheld. We may exchange cultural gifts, there may be smoking ceremonies or any other cultural protocols uh, as the custodians of that land see fit. Now, these connections make a real difference to how our people experience the processes of truth-telling. Relationships are central to the success of the commission like this and that, in many ways, it is what sets us apart. We are a royal commission with all the formalities and coercive powers of any other white commission, but we can also bend and shift to fit the needs of the people we're engaging with. So our people can submit artworks as evidence, poetry, cultural artefacts, music, 
We can come and have a yarn on your country over a cup of tea. We can hear your story. We can cry with you. We can share a laugh with you. And then we have a hug on the way out, which is my favourite part. And if you need, need more support after that, after we leave, we make those arrangements and we make sure that you're held through every process of this commission. We have a social and emotional wellbeing team supporting us during each and every step of our processes. The goal is always to ensure maximum reach with minimum harm. And this extends to how we hold and retain data and other information through implementation of Indigenous data sovereignty principles. So we want our people to walk away from the process feeling heard, feeling held, and maybe, and hopefully, a little bit healed, but not further harmed. And in this respect, I believe we are leading the way. It helps, I think, that we are a Truth and Justice Commission, tasked with also informing a treaty process. It offers people the hope of accountability, and that accountability will not just lay with the state, but with our people in the First People's Assembly. So for me, and being part of this commission, that's the big difference with the commission. The accountability sits with us too. And we don't want your book to be another inquiry, a 20-volume edit that sits on the shelves gathering dust. We want your book to be a living document to lead to transformation for all Victorians to come with us on that journey. So let's have a look and a listen at some of the people we heard so far and what uh, they've got to say. Colonisation made a big mistake because they said that we weren't smart, we weren't good parents, our men were drunks, our women were loose and that, you know, things like that. What they failed to remember is we all had a brain. Hence, our parents didn't stop us from teaching language because they were scared. They were smart enough to keep us surviving and that, right, so that... I had opportunities, Joey had opportunities, Stacey had opportunities and that. So intelligence doesn't come from what white fellas give us. It came from our ancestors because our ancestors taught us how to, you know, okay, sometimes it's the right time to speak and other times time to sit back and that. And that was the disillusion of white fellas thinking that we were done. So truth in storytelling and traditions have kept alive our people's culture since the advent of colonisation. So in our community, our elders provide cultural authority. They're strong story carriers and they were our first priority for our community. Elders aren't always old and we tend to die younger than most. And so capturing as many voices and histories was and continues to be critical for the Commission. And like many other gen organisations, our early progress was hampered by the pandemic. Our plans to meet with community on country was delayed by successive lockdowns, meaning some of our earliest contact with people was online. And we commenced visiting community in person from early 2022 and then commenced formal hearings in March 2022. So we actually travelled five weeks meeting with around 200 elders uh, across the state and what an honour and a privilege uh, that was. Many shared with us their stories, some so personal they had never spoken of them before. The stories were often hard to hear. They were painful, traumatic stories of dispossession, child removal, abandonment, sadness and anger. Amongst this grief and pain, there was also hope and resilience, and also, as Mob know, a bit of laughter too. We also heard about community-led initiatives, like one being run up near Albury, where first-year nurses and doctors stay on country for five weeks learning about local culture, bush medicine, and size of significance. All the elders we spoke to through yarning circles and public hearings pointed to the ongoing effects of discriminatory policies, racist beliefs, including those that led to stolen generations, 
policies and beliefs that not only affected them but continue to affect their children and grandchildren today. They in the town make white fellows out of you. So you know where they first moved to Australia into a bush. Dogs all of that corner. Not far. Three to that bridge. And then from there on, after only time they went and wanted us to go to school was when they come and look up, look for a sport. We were good sportsmen. And they turn around and say, Well, we've got to see my lady again. I said, Mum, well done. Oh, we're going up in the white man's the arms. What people are. I still remember I tell her, 41 on Ella Street. You know, we never stayed there. We wanted to go down to Fox Hollow. What? We wanted to be with the mission kids. We didn't want to be there. We didn't want to be well, man, where it is on the, on the sawmill. Say, oh, yeah. When he plays football, Wonderful rugby league player, one of the best. He wasn't allowed to go into the pub and drink with his mates. One of his mates got four years for giving him alcohol. Four years. Hey? You remember the days they called vagrants? Go out to trip and get drunk. You get 20 days. You have no money in your pocket, you'll get another 20 days. Went from home to home, and I'll tell you what, I've never in all my life work met so many racist mongrels in all my life. Every town I went to. You know, you talk about the truth. Now, I lived it. She don't know me. He don't know me. He knows me by name. My, my, my family don't know me. I did by name. But the crap that we put up with, me and my wife, and my children, they wouldn't believe you. I had a life ahead of me, but I was ruined through dissimulation. I was ruined, and I still carry hate within me. I didn't live in the past, but that journey from back there is still in my veins. So talk, people talk about a fair go. Come to Australia with a fair go, crap. You want to know something? The ones, ones that come out into Australia as more rights than what we got. I don't give a crap what anyone says. It's true. You want the truth? That's the truth. They're the two videos that I put in tonight, but we spoke to 200 over 200 elders and so that's over 200 truths and they were just down in circles and they did turn into to truth telling but these are the things we need to hear if we want true reconciliation in this country and they are on our website and I encourage you to go and start um, listening to those and looking at our, our formal hearings and I just need to say that this isn't about uh, shaming anybody. This is about understanding and healing together because we can't do this alone and we need um, we need people with us. But what we did hear again and again to, uh, on country with the elders was 11 main areas of concern and they are dispossession and dislocation political exclusion, representation and resistance, families, kinship and stolen children, stolen wages and economic marginalisation, legal injustice and incarceration, injuries to body and spirit, disrespect and denial of culture, damage to and denial of country, Stolen and misused knowledge, culture and data, a colonial education system and public silencing and denial. 
All these stories are captured in your book's first interim report, which was tabled in Parliament in early July and is available on our website. And it also has the links to all those videos uh, that I've been talking about. Many more stories are yet to be told. And so our work will continue. A further supplementary report will be delivered in the first half of 2023 which has as part of its focus recommendations for treaty negotiations. And your book is now inviting uh, another more submissions from all Victorian elders. So later in the year, we're inviting all First Peoples to make their submissions with all other Victorians to participate after that. And I encourage all of you here to please get involved. Please make a submission. Don't let this inquiry be something happening to someone else. We want to hear as many voices as possible in this process. And we want to hear from all non-Aboriginal uh, community members as well. I also, uh, our experience, um, want to share with you our experience of, of going on country um, was one of generosity from our elders. And I cannot um, tell you enough of how generous our people were with retelling stories uh, of hurt and pain that some had never even told before. The fact that we can do this in a way that is culturally safe, that we can hold people on country in their space to make them feel uh, held is... Uh, a space of um, for them of trust. And, and I said before, the trust is the most important thing. And I think that also comes in when we talk about reconciliation, um, that we need to be able to trust again. Um, and it's something that needs to be earned um, in the relationship of non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal Victorians. And how we go about that is is up to all of us to be part of that. Um, historical acceptance is critical to reconciliation in Australia, particularly in Victoria with this Truth and Justice Commission. Truth telling is not an adjunct to reconciliation, it is a precursor, and it can be achieved through any number of means, through commissions of inquiry like your rook or at a local state or even a personal level. It is no understatement to say that the truth Telling can be uncomfortable, deeply exposing process, but at its core, it serves as a bedrock for change and transformation. The point of the exercise is not to shame or blame individuals, and we don't want we don't want your backyard. It's about education, justice, and reform. I saw Andrew giggle there a bit, but people think we're taking your backyard, and I, I just, you know, I always say that if you. You've got to, you'll gain from this. We're not going to lose anything. I think if you take us on, you you then take on our um, aspects of our culture, which you will gain. Um, Victoria is leading the nation and its undertaking of historic work is something that we all should feel a great deal um, of pride about. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's a, a big, big task, but we can't do this alone. And that's why I cannot implore people enough to actually come to the Commission, take on um, what you can, listen to our stories. And I've got, and I say this a lot, and uh, the thing I'm going to say, and it's not to be rude, is if there's one thing you can do, that's shut up and listen. And if you get that bit right and you truly listen, we'll get the rest of it right. Um, I have realised that my keynote was for in-person and then I allowed spaces for um, questions. So um, we're not doing um, that tonight, but I'm happy to, uh, if Andrew wanted to add any um, questions that he, he felt that um, I hadn't covered, I'm happy to take those as well. Thanks so much, Sue Anne, for such a thought-provoking lecture. Um, and I think it's given us all a lot of thought for reflection. I um, I grimaced when you said that about the the, the backyards because I was remembering back um, in the Native Title Act and you had those racist campaigns by a number of companies um, that were saying people were going to lose their backyards, which of course never happened as well. 
Mm. I was wondering um, if you wanted to sort of talk a bit more about um, what, because often you get this a lot, uh, I do as well, a lot of non indigenous people say, what what can we do? Um, and you've talked a bit about that. I was wondering if you wanted to elaborate a bit more about, um, aside from shutting up and listening, what other <laughs> sort of areas that the non indigenous people can do in, in terms of educating themselves? Yeah, I think, I mean, I always say at the start, do you even know whose country you're on? And have you done the research about uh, the truth-telling about the lands that you live on, the lands you work on? Um, and instead of making it a, a token uh, acknowledgement or welcome of country or even, you know, it seems to be the thing now where you put it up in your um, signature when you're online, but do you know what it means? Do, do you, um, you know... Do you have an understanding of the hurt and pain that that land carries, but also what wealth it carries of, of knowledge and people that come before us? Like Annie Georgina spoke before about um, Annie Barat. And for people that don't know, Wurundjeri, um, they say, were 3,000 people, but they were whittled, we were whittled down to 13. We all descend from Annie Barat, from one woman. Go the strong women. Um, but... People don't know that. That's not that's not a story told. It's the, the story is told about the the Narangita, the men of the tribe that that really battled with government to you know have their own. You know they had the first inquiry at Corindirk where Aboriginal people were able uh, to have their voice heard. But before that, there was all this struggle going on. So I I I say to people one, have a look at where you live and where you work. What does it mean on that land? And two, before you ask the question of what can we do, I always put it back and say, what are you willing to do? Because I could ask you to come and march in the street with us. I could ask you to donate to one of our organisations. I could say, could you be a carer for one of our kids or can you do this? But are you prepared to do it? That's the question. How far can you can you go and, and what you know, and have a look at that first about, I think, challenge your own values and beliefs. What I will say is keep an eye on the commission, listen to the stories, and, and of course, I would, I would say make sure you're in a good space to listen to them, but deeply listen to them about what racist systems and structures have done to a peoples and truly understand how this is affected because once we get that narrative, we can join the dots that colonisation, I mean, we go from 1788 to current, so it's historic and contemporary. We will, we will help you join those dots to understand why and how we're in this position today. But we need your backing to help rectify it. And so when we're pushing for change, we don't want you to take the microphone. We want you behind us holding us up and helping us push forward. I think they're, they're the things that um, I would say. Uh, are the best things you can do. Thanks, Joanna. And, yes, I think that's a really important point you made earlier about all the videos and the information that's available on your website. Um, so I think that's a really important resource for people to use. And, I mean, WH Stammer talked about the great Australian silence from, you know, the mm. early 20th century to the to the um, late 20th century and, and argued that there was very little information available. That's certainly not the case anymore because as well as all the rich resources from the Europe Justice Commission, you've got an amazing amount of resources. So there's no excuse anymore for non indigenous people to say we don't know. Um, there's, yeah. there's information there for people to get. And uh, I'd strongly urge my non indigenous colleagues to, to look at that information rather than adding to cultural burdens by always asking Indigenous people. Le learning and educating yourselves, I think, is a really critical part of this uh, journey. Uh, and so, and I was wondering, another question I was sort of thinking off the top of my head uh, was, was about... I mean, because in the title, you're a justice commission, is, is, the, type, is the word justice. And I was yeah. wondering from your point of view, when the hearings have been concluded uh, and you've, you've talked to a range of elders and you've put your report in, what does justice then, um, what, what, how do you see justice then occurring and what do you see as, as, as a justice um, in terms of an outcome? I think there's different forms of justice. Uh, so just to be clear so people don't get a bit... We're not looking at individuals. We're looking at systems and structures. Uh, and I'll just let you know now, we're not going to tinker around the edges. That's all being done before and uh, we're not going to do that. We're looking at rebuilding, ripping down and, 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 and rebuilding um, structures. 
It could be in the way of new systems. It could be, you know, the outcome really we want is self-determination, that we're in the driver's seat, that we're able to say what is good enough for us, the way it needs to be done. It, it's, you know, we're sick of sitting at a table where there's only one or two of us and you're just getting, you know, people are kind enough to let you sit there and maybe listen. We want to be in the driver's seat. Self-determination is the ultimate outcome. New systems need to be had. Uh, um, so we're looking at addressing and redressing. What that looks like for individual, and so there's so many themes, right? There's 11, but there's a whole lot of sub-themes under those. Um, there won't be any surprises. We'll be uh, Recommendations will be tested with communities. Um, People will know what's coming. The government will know and be hopefully be prepared for what's coming um, in the future. But we're not treading lightly and we're not walking on eggshells. We're going and we're, you know, you only get one chance at this. Um, and, and I hope that that uh, non-Aboriginal people within Victoria have done the work enough to understand why we need it. And, you know, we're, we're happy to join those dots for people. That's part of, you know, the, we've got an education component to your rook. So that's why we encourage people, you know, to get on the website or if there's something, come and, come and read it or see or look at our videos. Because we, it's not just saying we want this. It's about why do we want this and why, how do we get here? So there's a big education component that we really need to make sure that, because that's going to bring everybody along then if you understand the whys. Um, and I, I think that answers. I think it answers your question, Andrew. No, that's great. And and I mean, you're just the the breadth of um, the topics when you've listed those topics before. Mm. Um, and a colleague of mine, Dr. Sadie Heckenberg, and I have done a lot of research into stolen wages, and and that's a, a hugely mm. complex issue just alone. And uh, just for the benefit of everyone else, this is a, a an issue that occurred for over 150 years across the country, and. In Queensland alone, it's, it's estimated up to $500 million uh, had been stolen off Indigenous people in terms of wages and, and um, benefits. And so there hasn't been um, uh, as much comprehensive research done in Victoria. But that just alone is a key area. I think it's, it seems like the Europe Justice Commission will be by easily the far as furthest reaching commission of all time in terms of the breadth of the topics that it needs to look at. So I think they're yeah. some critical areas. I think, um, Andrew, some of the, the things that really stood out was soldier settlement. Yep, yep. There was a lot around cemeteries. I went down a rabbit hole the other day of looking at just the different aspects of uh, public and private uh, cemeteries, uh, health, medi medical. Um, that's not even talking about child protection. We're not in, let alone the justice system in itself. Um, you know, just... There's themes that, that cross cut and they would be identity, um, self determination, and racism. Mm -hmm. And they're the three that just keep popping up through these other themes. And, you know, this, those themes are just from our elders. Mm -hmm. You know, and you look at the sub themes, and it's a big job. I don't think we've asked for an extension and, um, of an extra two years. Uh, so that would bring it to five. And, and I, don't, I still don't, to be honest, don't think that's enough time. But at least this gives us time to lay the proper foundation that needs to be laid for, for further work, for future yeah, work. Absolutely. And, of course, at the same time that the Euro Justice Commission is proceeding, um, which is a, a ground, groundbreaking national initiative, Victoria is also leading the way with treaty movements as well. And yeah. I, I'm delighted to see other states and territories looking at similar um, areas. And, of course, uh, Dr Jackie Huggins is leading a lot of this work in, in Queensland. Um, and so it's really good to see other states and territories starting to take these up, these areas up as well. But I'm wondering with the work that the Euro Justice Commission is doing, how do you see that feeding into the um, concurrent process of, of the treaty discussion? Yeah, so um, to put it in a way people understand, our evidence will provide will help provide how what a framework looks like mm -hmm. and how that will work moving forward. Um, the, the letters patent actually tell us that we don't just give our reports to government, but we also give them to the First People's Assembly. Now, that's a first in itself. Mm. Now, that puts you on a little bit of equal footing, but it also, as I said before, it puts us in, in it makes us responsible as well now. So all those other royal commissions, and, I mean, 
you know, people say to us, how do we know this just isn't going to be another one? Well, we don't, right? But what we can do is take all our learnings from everything else. We've got another mechanism, which is the treaty process to help push forward. Uh, and so uh, gathering all that work that's been done before us and being able to put that, that forward with recommendations to a body of our people, of our peers that are able to push that forward, that's that's groundbreaking in itself and I think it's amazing and, and that will help, yeah, it's the evidence to help start forming what a treaty will look like. No, look, thank you so much for answering the questions and I'm, I'm sorry to the audience that we're not live and we can't ask questions directly for the audience, but uh, I think that was great to get some um, some further um, discussions from you there. So, look, thank you again, Sue Ann, for your wonderful presentation. It's a real honour and uh, yeah, urge everyone to... Um, jump onto the Europe Justice Commission website and start to look around at um, some of the amazing uh, work that you're doing. And I also like um, like how you talked in your presentation about um, truth telling, not just about the past, but also about the present and the future mm -hmm. as well. I think that's critical um, because, you know, we want to build a society that's a much fairer society with no racism and that involves looking at the future as well. So I think there's that circular notion of time in there that's really important as well. But Thank you again, Simone, for your time and really grateful for your presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. I'd like to also uh, acknowledge um, the great work of Simone Hamlin. It, it struck me as when I was going through all those amazing speakers, including Sue Ann, that have been uh, so generous with their time over the last six years, that uh, Simone's been instrumental in organising every single one of them. So I really want to thank Simone for such a long period of uh, great work at being able to pivot from face-to-face -to, -face to online to hybrid and hopefully in the very near future to uh, go back to a face-to-face -face event as well. I'd like to thank our Vice-Chancellor for your continuing support, Pascal, in these lectures and uh, really uh, looking forward to seeing um, the BRAC Wonga ration coming up in a couple of months as well. So thank you everyone again for attending uh, and good evening.